now. If you have your Bibles, open to Mark chapter 4, if you would, please. Mark chapter 4. Talking about storms and have been for a few weeks. This morning we preached on this account. I want to bring three other points tonight about this, about this particular storm, which is different than the other two that we've looked at. We've looked at Noah and his storm, the storm of judgment. We've looked at Jonah and his storm of alarm clock of waking him up, of, of getting his attention. And then you have this storm where really there's a storm of growth, a storm, a trial of patience and faith, as James puts it. It's one that we will often face in life, these storms, these types of storms, okay? And I mentioned this morning where before this storm took place, the disciples were not off making bad decisions. They had just very briefly before finished listening to the Sermon on the Mount. They were serving with Jesus. They were helping him, and then the storm comes. I mentioned this morning, it's often, it seems like it's often the way it happens, that something bad happens on the way home from church. All right, it's like, oh, come on. Yeah, here I am serving God, I'm, I'm teaching Sunday school class, and I'm working on a bus route, and, and now I have a problem, my bus breaks down, now I'm stuck, I can't even get home to eat today. I'll probably never eat again, will I? I'm stuck out here with 40 kids who have no control. God must not care about me. We think that. And this is that type of storm. If you would look at me in Mark chapter 4, starting in verse number 35. And the same day when the even was come, he, Jesus, saith unto them, let us pass over unto the other side. And when they, the disciples, had sent them away, the multitude, they took him, even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. Just a minor note plug for this morning's sermon. If you didn't hear or you weren't in here, you might want to listen to it talking about self-reliance. I will not re-preach the sermon. But the first problem was that they began to row the boat, sail the boat without the Lord. He was in it, but he wasn't part of the operation. And that's where they really made their mistake, I believe. I will not re-preach that sermon, though. Verse 37, and there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith. And they feared exceedingly. And said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? What amazes me is a few things about this passage I'm going to look at tonight. One, it was a big storm. The, the, the word there in our Bible says it was great. There's also a great calm. The Greek word there is mega. You know, you've heard of a megaphone, a mega corporation, a megaton bomb, a mega storm. It never refers to something small. Right? This is my mega corporation as one employee. It's a mega storm. I felt a drop of water on me. It's a megaphone, and you can't hear me at all. It's always something great. This was a big, big catastrophe. This was huge. This was massive. It could have possibly been the biggest storm they'd ever seen in their time as, sailor, as sailors. It was that big. They were afraid for their life. It was huge. I don't want to downplay that storm because in our life, we'll hit some storms that seem to be massive, that seem to be huge, that are mega trials, mega storms. Easy for someone else to say, oh, dude, come on, what's wrong with you? Yeah, it'll be fine. Not realizing that that storm to us is like our boat is now full. It was a big storm. It was surprising. In verse 37, the Bible says there arose a great storm. The idea there when the rose is it came out quickly. The idea in some writers would say that it came out of nowhere almost. That when they left the shore, there was nothing in the sky. There's nothing that would indicate something was about to happen. There's nothing to indicate that, that maybe this wasn't a good time to sail. Unlike later on when Paul said to the shipmaster, don't sail, there's a storm coming. These guys had no premonition. And they'd sailed on the Sea of Galilee before. before. Storms could come up on the Sea of Galilee per scholars and historians. It was not unheard of that storms would, would, would just pop up on the Sea of Galilee. But this one surprised them. There arose a storm. And sometimes in our life, it seems that trouble comes out of nowhere. See, so we're going along, living a great, having a great time, living a great life, everything's rolling well, then boom, 
drop, and the bottom just seems to fall out. And we go from zero to 100 like that. That was this type of operation, this type of storm. And it left the disciples in quite a lurch, left them in quite a predicament, left them in a big, worried, fearful mess. But what I want to look at tonight, if the Lord would let us, is that little phrase, we'll look at it more, but really focus on this, verse 38, and he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. This morning I, I uh, expressed my feelings about that. There are times we think the Lord is asleep on a pillow. And really, like I mentioned this morning, like a stinking pillow. Say, God, are you really asleep? We'll talk about that. But the title of my sermon tonight is, It's Time to Sleep. Because really, what Jesus was doing was the best thing in that storm. He was, he was asleep. And it often in a storm in our life, we can't sleep. I'm talking about physically sleep. You lay in bed at night and your mind just goes. When the world stops swirling, your mind begins to swirl. And sleep is elusive. They see like every time you shut your eyes, you're getting your car or, or stop at work, that those thoughts, that trial, those troubles come just flooding back into your mind. And, and it's like, I can't not, not only not deal with this, I can't even find any kind of solace, any kind of rest. And there Jesus is in the midst of this storm that was probably the biggest storm they'd ever seen, a storm that they thought was going to absolutely end their life. He's asleep, and he's able to sleep in the back of the boat. I believe there's a lesson for us in that so that we're also able to sleep through storms. Lord, would you help us tonight? Would you give us wisdom? Lord, make this time profitable by your word. Would it touch our heart? Would your spirit work? Lord, there may be some cares, some hurt tonight, some storms that need a touch from you, and I pray that tonight your spirit, your word, its power would touch hearts. Lord, we'd see some victory tonight. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. What I want to focus on at first, like I mentioned, is the resting of the master. The, re the resting of the master. I want to point out this, this thing, though. In this account, all right, he's asleep, and it appears that he, that, he, that he doesn't care. I talked about that this morning. I will not talk about the whole thing, but it appears that Jesus does not care. Hence the disciples' question, carest thou not that we perish? Like, Jesus, what is wrong with you? Why do you not care about us? All right, how could you go from, from loving us and having us be your disciples, and then all of a sudden you don't give a lick about us because we're about to die while you're in the boat? It appears that Jesus does not care. But understand something, that this is a false perception. And in a trial in your life and in my life, often the thoughts will come into your head and my head that Jesus doesn't care, that he's forgotten, that he's missed the mark, that he's not capable of helping us. And can I submit this? That is a lie straight from the devil himself. When the devil comes and your flesh comes and says, Jesus does not care, you must strike that thought down immediately. The Bible says this, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Right? Is that true or false? It's true, but we feel like it's false in the middle of a storm. The disciples thought it to be false because Jesus obviously didn't care that they perished. Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good thing will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. John 59, as the Father hath loved you, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Understand something, in storms, there's going to come those thoughts that Jesus does not care, and they are completely, 100% false. They are a lie, absolute lie. It is a trap of the devil, a trap of the flesh. It is anti-God. Jesus does, and Jesus always cares. Thank you. When Jesus was asleep in the boat, did he care? All right, but he was sleeping. But he still cared. He cares, Jesus cares. I liken it to this. There are parents who care, and there are parents who truly don't care. Okay? There are parents who care and people who truly, truly don't care. Now, I have worked in the school the last 12 years now, and uh, this next year, of course, will be a transition with, with Brother Goldemez, and he's going to do a great job. And, and he'll find this out that there are some parents in our school that care. I've coined the phrase 12 years ago, Mother Bears. I remember the first time that I experienced this. I'm in my office, 
And I remember this lady on the other side of my desk, and she was explaining the situation, and she was explaining it very calmly and sedately. You believe that? Because I'm lying to you right now. She was passionate. She was expressive. She was vocally loud. She was, had hand motions, too. And I remember, I'm like sitting there on the desk, and, and she's like pointing all right, and, and if you could, you've seen those cartoons frothing at the mouth. Okay, I, she wasn't really, but you know, and so I had like this kind of out-of-body experience, okay? Maybe you've had this in life. I'm sitting there in my seat, I'm listening, and then I begin to think, and my mind begin to wander. I'm like, why is she so upset at me? I remember the situation was nothing to do with me. All right, now, I was part of the school, but I, I did not kill a child, okay? I was not around the child. I not interacted. With, there was nothing to do with me, but she was very, 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 very um, passionate about this. And then it struck me, as from the Lord, that I said, wow, she loves her child so much that anything that stands in the way of that love for that child is about to get demolished. And then I thought, just like a mother bear I've read about before, and it helped me because then I wasn't reacting about against me. It was, what was the problem? And I was so thankful the Lord gave me that wisdom. That was not for me. That's from the Lord. All right, because then we could deal with, with, with the problem. And I, you know, listen, I've not been perfect as a principal. I know that. That's why I got Brother Goldman. He'll be perfect, all right? I'm not. But I am so thankful that we have a school full of parents that absolutely care. All right, that the parents that will come in and say, you know what? Here's a problem. If there's a problem, they'll fix it. That's awesome. They care about their kids' grades. They care about what goes on. And, and they do even though sometimes things that would make you think that they don't bear, care about their child. Right? Some of these parents have let their child flunk a test before. It's not good to flunk a test, but they've let, them to, let their kid learn a lesson. Oh, boy, those mean parents. That's terrible. Don't you care? Carest thou not if we fail? Of course I care. But you need to learn something right here. Man, some of, them, some of the parents let their kids go to sports and the coaches are just abusive to them. I know, I've been one. They have to run in soccer. Oh, it's their little kid running. I tell you what, I, I, boy, soccer. I ref for a little while on those moms out there, the moms of the daughters in soccer. Woo! We had moms of the boys too when I was first coaching. It was uh, Mrs. Gilbert's back there. She was one of those moms yelling. It was you and Mrs. Black and... Mrs. Kirchmar, was that the third one? Who's the third one? They were, oh, don't start with me. Those moms came to every game for me, and they were screaming their heads off of those games. And heaven help the ref who did not make a call for one of those kids, right? Oh, stop it. Stop it, Mrs. Gilbert. I, I was like, go. I whispered things for her to say. But they, they, they have their kids run, and, and the kids su sweat. And they come home, oh, my legs are sore. Carousel, not that we get sore. Of course I care. I don't want you to die, but you're going to learn something. And in the middle of that storm, the disciples came to Jesus. Cares thou not that we perish? Of course I care. But there's something that's going to be accomplished here, something that you're going to see. You see, there are some parents who don't care. I read this article just, it happened a few months back. I read it again recently. That absolutely broke my heart. These parents, they're in California, and they said what started as neglect became dangerous and pervasive child abuse. If they misbehaved, the 13 siblings living in Southern California would be tied to their beds as punishment, first with ropes until a child was able to wiggle free, and then they would use chains and padlocks. Over time, the periods in which the siblings were confined grew longer, and they would not even be released to use the bathroom. The family dogs, however, were very healthy. They lived in these conditions for years and went undiscovered until finally the 17-year-old girl escaped from the house in this article this past week. The siblings who ranged in age from 2 to 29 years old were severely malnourished. When they weren't changed, they were fed very little on a, on a schedule. The parents would buy food for themselves, but prohibit the children from having any, with the exception of the 2-year-old who was getting enough to eat. Sometimes authorities said the parents would buy an apple or pumpkin pie, leave them on the counter, and forbid the kids, prohibit them from even tasting them. The 12-year-old was so malnourished that the, his weight was that of an average 7-year-old. The 29-year-old female victim, daughter, weighed 82 pounds. They were permitted to bathe once a year. 
And if they washed their hands above the wrists, they'd be chained up as a punishment for playing with water. Now that's a parent, two parents who don't care. We would never hold those, kids, those parents up as model parents, would we? Yet, we're in the middle of a storm. And we go to Jesus and we say, Jesus, don't you care? And in a sense, we're accusing him of being that type of parent. Do you see the danger in that? Do you see the absolute, complete falseness of that statement, of that question? Jesus is not that parent. God is not that kind of father, is he? He absolutely cares about us, absolutely loves us, and he cares because, because Jesus cares. It's about perspective. See, this is true, though, with Jesus. What is seen isn't always what is. What is seen isn't always what is. He was asleep. That's what's seen, but that wasn't what was. Throughout the Bible, we see that. You see, Gideon, what was seen was he appeared to be crazy. He's going to battle with a trumpet, a candle, and something to cover it. But what was seen wasn't what is. Lazarus, it appeared that Jesus arrived too late, but he arrived right on time for the resurrection. Jesus appeared to die on the cross and to appear to be a failure. The soldiers and the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees thought that they had won. This was a victory for them. <laughs> they just had a party too soon. Three days too soon to be exact. Because what was seen wasn't what was. And I want you to think about this. We talked about Jonah and the storm. And Jonah in chapter 1, the Bible says that then the mariners, speaking of Jonah, were afraid and cried every man unto his God. And cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten of them. But Jonah was gone down to the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. Now think about this. Jonah was asleep and slept through a storm, and Jesus was asleep and slept through a storm. But they slept through the storm for entirely different reasons. You see, Jonah slept through the storm because he didn't care. He's running from God. He didn't care what happened to him. He just knew he didn't want to go to Nineveh. He did not care. Jesus slept through the storm. Get this. Because he wasn't worried. He wasn't worried about the storm. This was no big deal. He had created this. He could calm it. It was not a problem. It wasn't his time to die yet. Was there a cross there? Were there soldiers? Was there a soldier with a spear to pierce his side like the psalmist had, had prophesied? I don't think so. Was there a rag or a sponge full of vinegar to offer to him? I don't think so. It wasn't his time to die yet. Was he led like a lamb? Had, the, had, the, had his, his entrance into Jerusalem, had it happened yet? Not yet. He wasn't worried because th this was nothing. So he could go to sleep because he wasn't worried. You see, we all want to have that calmness that Jesus displayed in his humanity. His humanity is what slept, not his godliness. You get that all right? God doesn't sleep. The Bible says that. Jesus in his humanity slept. He displayed the calmness that we want to have. I looked up different sleep techniques. How do the experts try to sleep when life seems too rough? I found this one doctor, this MD. He said, I will take my thumbs and push up on the bone at the top of my eye socket on both sides. I guess like this. Makes him fall asleep. This lady, who expert, sleep expert. I tell myself that in five minutes, I have to go get up and go out to a meeting. I imagine all the steps, stretching, putting in my contact lenses, getting dressed, putting on my makeup, all of it. Often it sounds so exhausting that I feel glad to relax back into my bed. Another doctor, I do reclining belt pose, my favorite yoga pose, to chill out. And the last doctor, I count backwards from 300 by threes. It is mathematically so complicated, you can't think of anything else, and it is so boring, I am out like a light. Is that what we're regulated to? Is that what we have to worry about? The only way to sleep in a storm now is to count backward from 300 by threes and bore our mind? Yet if we're honest, there are times that we've tried some of those things, haven't we? Counting sheep, thinking of a blank piece of paper, crowding out all the thoughts. There has to be something else that can go on, can, 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 right? There has to be some other thing that we can claim to help us sleep through the storms like Jesus did. We see next on this, in this storm, though, we see the power of the Savior. In verse number 39, he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. I see this, that he rebuked the wind. One, uh, one expert uh, submitted that perhaps 
that the devil is a prince of the power of the air, and Jesus rebuked the wind to rebuke the prince of the power of the air, and, and he told the sea, peace be still. He was different with the water. Possible, I wouldn't die on a hill for it, but a, a different interesting thought. He did rebuke the wind, and it stopped, and he, and he commanded the sea to be calm. I noticed, first of all, this was significant. It was significant when he solved this problem. It was done. When Jesus did it, it was done, right? Problem over. Problem solved. They were amazed. Right? The Bible says that. They're amazed. Look at it. Verse uh, 41, were they amazed? So help me here. What did they expect Jesus to do? They're about to die. They run to Jesus. They wake him up. Care so now that we perish. What did they expect him? And how did they expect him to solve the problem? Remember, the boat was now full of water. Did they expect him to grab a bucket and empty the bucket of water out of the boat? Help me here. What were they expecting? To lift the boat out of the water to make the water disappear? Uh, they were scared of the storm and he stopped the storm. They're like, whoa, the storm stopped. What did you want to have happen? Fly? You know, like, uh, <laughs> who was that, Peter Pan in the boat? Above the storm? That'd be cool. It, it caught me that, that they're like, they're amazed. Like, oh, oh, Jesus, you solved the problem. Of course he did. All right, he's Jesus. And you woke him up too. If for no other reason you woke him out of a good sleep, he's going to stop the storm. All right, for no other reason to say, fine, you get this, Eric, because I'm done going back to sleep. I love this. Jesus always liked to solve differently than we expect. He always liked to solve things differently than we expect. Sometimes he brings work. Sometimes he brings money. Sometimes he brings healing. Sometimes he brings patience. Sometimes he brings a car. Sometimes he just brings another half gallon of gas. Sometimes he brings feet to walk. You see, they had seen those things before. I talked about this morning. They'd seen demons cast out. They'd seen sickness being healed instantly. We would be moved by all that. Someone walked in on one leg and walked out with two. If someone came in dead and came out alive, we'd be moved by all that. But they were moved by the power that Jesus displayed over the storm. It was significant. But I like this. It was also symbolic. This was symbolic. He saw the problem for life's greatest problem, our sin, but also for life's little problems. Think about this. If Jesus can command the elements, then what's too hard for him? If he can stop the wind, then what can he not solve? Well, I wrote some things down here. I just need some food, Lord. I'm hungry. Food, don't worry about it. I've seen that one done. Just ask the widow at Zarephath. Lord, I've got, I've got some taxes and bills, that, that, and I've got some, some things I've got to get paid, and I, and, I, and I can't seem to find the money for them. Oh, oh, you have some obligations? Don't worry about that. Done. Just go fishing. There's going to be some money in the fish's mouth. Lord, I've got some enemies. I've got some people that are out to get me. Oh, let's see how we can solve that. We can use hornets in the Old Testament. We can use water after we walk through it on dry land. We can use a mirage that looks like blood, but it's not. It's just water. We can use a rustling in the trees. We can uh, even have people just wake up dead. So don't worry about your enemies. 